Right, good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> this particular lecture is the first lecture on managerial research methods. And it starts by looking at the basis, what, what, what underlies managerial research methods. And there's sort of two ways that you can teach managerial research. Um, the first way is that you can start the students doing some research so that you get some, some project, it might just be a survey or something, and you start on that, and, and you do the survey, and then you talk about what that means, and then you start talking about the methods that you use. That, that's one way. The other way is to outline the basis, the fundamentals of managerial research methods, and then having sort of put that overview in place, then you look at each one in turn. Now this, this course does that. It starts with, by looking at the basis of managerial research. Now the problem with that is that it's a lot of new words, a whole lot of new terms. Uh, so it's, it's really quite heavy on the new words and, and I'll try to introduce some of them as we go. But don't worry if you don't, don't understand them all immediately because these are the words that would be, you'd be learning if you developed in this course. So that's, that's the way we go. Um, the, most of the books, most of the good books on managerial research methods take the approach that we're taking here. Uh, but I, I do things, a couple of things differently. The way that I divide up the categories for managerial research is a bit different from what most people do. Uh, and I've got reasons for that. But the other thing is that I'm going to emphasize how managerial research is based on ideas of scientific research. It's based on science. And guess what? It's based on managerial research came from the social sciences. The social sciences came from the physical sciences. So we're going to look at the start of the physical sciences. And I spend quite a bit of time talking about the start of the physical sciences. And what it is that's in the physical sciences, which 400 years ago, 400 years ago, was important and is carried into social science research and is carried into our business research. So that's why we go back and, and look at the start of the physical sciences, because that's the foundation of what we're doing. All right, so let's just get underway. The talk goes like this. We're going to begin talking about the classification of the methods researchers use in managerial research. So when we say that, the methods that researchers use in managerial research, um, we've immediately got a problem. What counts as managerial research? What is it? And we're going to be talking about some possible ways of looking at managerial research. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about the standards required in research because I want to introduce you to the idea that, that one of the most important things in research is that you work to the proper international standards, so that your work uh, is a part of the research community's work, the academic work that everybody's involved in. We will talk a little bit about the structure of the social sciences, something you've heard me on before actually, and then marketing research is the, the first one up. That's the first precise area of research that we're going to be talking about. And, and we won't get too far on that, but I'll introduce some ideas on that today. Okay, so if we're going to talk about managerial research, we need a working definition, as I've called it there, of management. Managers make decisions about practical situations. That, that is about the best short definition of management that I know, actually. The, the essence of management is decision making, and your courses, in fact, brought that out all the way through at different points. Uh, so it's make decisions, and it's about practical situations. It's about things in the real world. It's about making the world better, as we've talked about before. So decision making is the essential core of management, and the quality of the manager's work depends on the quality of the decisions that are made. So if you focus on improving your decisions, then you will be improving what you do overall. 
And the decisions the management make, um, makes is, are diverse because their situations are diverse. In other words, there's all sorts of different areas of management and these different areas all have their own special requirements. So if you're, if you're in, in, in marketing and you're making marketing type decisions, that's quite different from if you're building a building, isn't it? But they're still under the heading of management. And research can assist many of the decisions. Research is important in the decision making. So there's all sorts of ways that research is important in decision making. And that's one of the things that we must be concerned about. If we take this point that research is about the manager's making of decisions, then research becomes something that managers use. In other words, it's a tool for managers. It's something that they can use. It's something there that they can draw upon in the same way as they can draw upon other things in their work. And I put the, the little slogan there, the handmaiden to business, the handmaiden to business. In other words, researchers and research is actually serving business. It's at the beck and call of business. It does what is right uh, in relation to business. That's its, um, its basic uh, justification. Now, if you're talking about research in that way, then the big category that applies is, the, is research as technology. Research is a technology. The same way as this is a piece of technology that we use to drive this thing, research is a piece of technology that you can use to drive business <coughs> decisions, business or management decisions. All right. So what are some examples of research as technology? Well, the one that you're most familiar with is marketing research. Marketing research is going to be good if it helps the people sell more of the product or the service that they're trying to sell. Uh, it's as simple as that. It's, it's just a tool to achieve that. There's no suggestion when you do marketing research that you're finding out any great truth about the world or that you're getting any great understanding of anything, that you're coming across anything dramatically new or different. Marketing research is just focused on this business of selling things and how to promote things, nothing else. And what we promote today might not be of interest tomorrow, might be gone. So marketing research is really quite narrow in that sort of sense. Another one is policy research, policy research. And the main people that buy policy research are governments, right? So the government in Beijing buys a heap of research. And I was reading an article the other day saying that there's not enough research going on in terms of the governance of China. They need more information about this. They need more analysis about that. And some of the areas that are important, like, for example, economic research, big area of economic research. Some of you could end up actually working in research in economics for the government. But it's not just the central government. It's also the provincial government. They need a, a whole lot of people to, to, to undertake studies into how to develop our province, where we're going to develop new cities, where we're going to develop new farmland, what is going to be the future, all those things. That all requires a lot of research. And that's policy research. And not just at the provincial area level either, but also at the city level. The city here, they have their own set of researchers studying developments within the city, for example, economic things loom large, but also social things. If you're going to, going to manage a city, you're going to have to make sure that you've got enough schools for the children. Where are you going to put the schools? You've got to have researchers working on the demographics, on the way that the population is changing so that you know where to put your schools. All right, that's a simple example, but that sort of example runs right through everything. In terms of your careers, if you actually like this business of research, if you're the sort, sort that likes to inquire into things and find out new things, you might think in terms of, of, of being a researcher. You possibly haven't thought of being a social science researcher, but the course that you're doing uh, would set you up quite well to go on and become a researcher in, in some aspect of social science.
for example, a demographer looking at populations, population changes. A right? lot of work for demographers, a lot of work, a um, lot of jobs. So try and think about those sorts of things when you're thinking about your own career. So that's policy research. Another one which is related in some ways to policy research is evaluations. There's a whole set of research methodologies, especially for evaluations. An evaluation is what you undertake, a research and evaluation is what you undertake whether, when you want to know whether something is successful or not. And usually an evaluation, a big part of it, is whether you're getting value for money. All right? Whether you're getting value for money. So we might have something that develops here in this university, some new thing. They might, for example, put on a new course, and there's a whole new course, but none of the students want to do it. None of the students want to do it. It costs a lot of money to put a new course in place, but the students don't want to do it. That sort of situation gives rise to a question for the managers of the university. Shall we keep this new course going, or shall we not keep the new course going? They will then hire people to evaluate the new course. And they will be researchers. Their research, the kind of research they're doing, would be a form of technology that would be directed at this question. Shall we keep the course going or shall we not keep the course going? And they would consider all sorts of things in that sort of research. They would consider right on there the needs of China, whether China needs people who to learn about this subject. Then they would consider the ability of the university to deliver the subject. Have we got the teachers that can do it? Is this our specialist area? Should we be doing this or should another university be doing it? Then they will consider how many students say that they have an interest in it and how many students are likely to want to take it in the future. There's a big social science research project in that. They'll bring all this information together and they'll write a report and that report will be a summary with a recommendation. In the same way as in your projects, you've been making recommendations with your propositions and theses in your papers, this sort of research does exactly that. So it would bring up a conclusion, we recommend that the university scraps the course, or the university develops the course. Usually the recommendations that you get in evaluation research they don't say sort of yes or no. They say, develop this, develop some of that. They're kind of big, big decisions, big, big compromise decisions. So that's evaluation research. Now the kind of methods that you use, the research methods that you use for evaluation research, different from the ones that you use in policy research, different from the ones that you use in market research. The next one is budget cycle preparations. You remember your planning cycle that we did earlier on? The planning cycle? Into every level of that planning cycle, there can be the need for research. Right? So that when managers are looking at the, the planning itself, the long-range planning, strategic planning, they need researchers to analyse the business environment and to write reports on that. But also, when you're thinking about organising, how you're going to structure within your business, that requires research too, uh, but a different kind of research. And so it goes on. So a lot of the budget cycle preparations requires research, which we can call managerial research in a general way, managerial research. And that I've got as a separate category there. Most of that research does not get published. You can't actually find that research on the internet because companies will, will have it done and then they will use it themselves but they won't tell anybody about it. It will be their private business, which is fair enough. And they will be paying researchers to do that. And it's all very confidential because quite often when you're doing that kind of research you come, come across interesting things. Like you might learn something about your competitors and what they're going to do or what they're not likely to do. That sort of information is very valuable and worth having. So, so budget cycle research, they don't usually publish just as a matter of course. Another type of research that's really important and is also not published, negotiation preparations. 
That was a, once upon a time I, I had the job of doing that. I was a, a researcher that did preparations for negotiations. And so my job was that before the negotiations started, to check it all out, to investigate everybody and everything that I possibly could and bring up a big dossier on inf of information so that when our people went into the negotiation, they were well prepared. So the people came in negotiating, came through the door and said, oh, very nice to meet you. They knew all about them before they met them because they'd just read two pages all about each person. They knew all about who they were negotiating with. Now that's a kind of research, that's managerial research. Uh, and and I, I bet you've never thought of a career doing that. But that's the sort of research that you might be able to do. A lot of people get employed to do that. And, and so I point that out to you. So that's negotiation preparation. Another kind of managerial research relates to investments. And I'm talking about particularly investments on the stock exchange. You got, uh, with the, the evaluation of big companies, whether or not they're worth putting money into and what they're worth, there's kind of two aspects. There's the financial analysis and then there's everything else. All, all the social science inquiries, right? Now, the financials one side, and there are lots of courses on financial analysis. There aren't a lot of courses, actually, on investment analysis. Um, I should be a bit careful when I say that. In some places, there are heaps of courses on investment analysis. Uh, but I, I was thinking of here, actually. When I, when I looked at our courses here, I thought, wow, you've got a lot on finance. A lot on finance, and you could have more on some other things. OK. So that's investment analysis. Again, it's research as technology. The next one up is some economic research. Some economic research. And this is something I've mentioned to you before. Some economic research is technology. It's, it's economists trying to give advice on particular matters, practical decisions that have to be made. But not all economic research is like that. Some economic research says, how on earth does the economy work? We're not doing any practical advice here or anything. We're just actually trying to find out how the economy works. If you ask that sort of question, how does the economy work, then you're in the realm of science. And we'll come to that in a moment. But that's not the same as saying, how do I make the economy work better? That's a different question. If you say, how do I make the economy work better, then you're in the area of technology. And most of the economists get paid for that. But quite a few of them like to just try and figure out how the economy works anyway. OK, so some economics research, some business research. Well, there's all sorts of things that you could call business research. I struggle to find the difference, really, between the expression business research and management research. They really pretty much mean the same thing business research and management research. I mean, you could, some people say, oh, business research is much more focused on companies. Well, yes, that's true, but management research could focus on companies too. So I don't think there's much point in trying to distinguish between business and management research. Um, but when we say business research like that, you probably mean research that's within a business, right, within a business to do with the, the long-term planning of the business, not, not different from what we've just been talking about. The last one that I mentioned there, applied mathematics, right, there's, there's a whole branch of mathematics that deals with solving practical problems, right, finding out what's the best way to do this and what's the best way to do that, and that's a whole branch of mathematics. And, you could, and, and that's research as technology and it is a social science research. We don't do that because we're not doing mathematics in this course. But, um, but that's, that's a good thing too. And a lot of people quite like that. So in summary, if we're talking about research as a technology, research as a tool, and those are the areas that we might have to consider. I mentioned to you that with all those areas, you've then got to put them against the various situations where management appears. So you've had a list of the, the different kinds, now a list of the different areas. We've talked about central government a moment ago. Uh, 
the need for more and more research because the decisions are getting more and more complicated, more and more specialists are required, but local government and private companies the same way, and also voluntary agencies these days employ enormous numbers of researchers uh, to do this kind of work. And there's various special purpose organisations, and I've listed hospitals, the school, the military, the industry, um, all these group industry representatives, all these groups have research organisations uh, providing information. And any of that you could take under the heading business research. Business research is not just about business in the narrow sense of commercial companies. It's in this wider sense. And, and one of the things in, in, in courses like yours that you've got to kind of get a handle on, you come here and you think that because you're doing a business course or a management course that you're only involved in with small companies or big companies, international companies maybe, but you're also involved with government. Government's in business too. Government is as much in business as anything is. So I'm trying to extend the way that you use this word uh, management and business. Okay, so how are we going to classify management research? There are four ways suggested here, four ways. First of all, by the people or the organizations that produce the work. And I said, this leads to questions about purpose. We'll come to that. I'll just go through them, and then we'll come back and talk some, about some examples. Secondly, by the character or kind of the research outputs. This also leads to questions about the purpose. Nextly, by the purpose itself. And this leads to ontological questions. Now, that's a big and different word that we'll come to. Ontological questions. And lastly there, by the method of inquiry, method of inquiry, how the inquiry goes, and that leads to epistemological questions, another big and different word. So you've got from that, you've got your four different ways that you might classify business or management research, and all of them really relate to the purpose or the method of inquiry. And if you're concerned about the purpose of the re research, then the area of concern, the place where there's the debate about that, is in a subject called ontology, which we're going to talk about very briefly in a moment. If you're concerned about methods of inquiry, and remember this thing's called business research methods, this talk now, then it leads to epistemological questions, and I've got to tell you what that means too. All right, so let's just go back to the first one. I don't know whether there was a separate slide on it or not. The first one, by the people and organizations who produce the work, who produces this research? Well, where does it come from? Well, probably, I don't know about most of it, but a lot of it is produced by in-house researchers. In other words, companies and government agencies and so forth have their own research departments, okay? Wide variety of job titles, strong links to planning cycles, etc. So that, that's fine. Then there's central and local government agencies that we've talked about. Another place that this stuff is produced is consulting companies. And there's all sorts of consulting companies, lots of them. And many of you might, might wish to work in consulting companies. People quite often come to me and ask, how do I work in a consulting company? They think they'd like to be a consultant. Uh, and, and that's quite possible, practical. Uh, and then university researchers uh, in different departments in the university, you get this sort of research. Well, that's one classification of it, but it's probably not the best. So next classification, classifying it from the basis of what's produced. Well, in-house reports which aren't published, that's obvious. Public research information reports and they usually have some mix of public purpose with marketing objectives. What do I say there? Public research information reports. I'm going to show you an example in a little while of a report that somebody's published on the internet. That report looks like a research report, and, and I suppose it is a research report of sorts, 
but it's also being published by that company as a part of their marketing. As a part of their marketing. So they're not disinterested or, or you know, impartial. They've got a point of view in that. And you need to be suspicious of research that has that in it. Argumentative essays and reports, you know something about those because you have done that sort of work. That's where you're, you were starting in, in your assignment for this course. Argumentative essays and reports, and they are, as I've called it, they are serious contributions to the public debate, or it might be the debate within a company. And lastly, the one that you tend to think of when you think of reports that are produced, scientific reports in papers these are the ones that are published in the academic journals that you've been looking at in your course. And these particular ones, uh, the thing about them is that they are always subject to peer review, that, that other academic researchers get to look at them and say whether the work is adequate. Okay. We're going to examine some examples to orient you to the publications. Always when you start looking at a publication, there are some key questions. You always ask yourself, who wrote this thing and why did they write it? You have to develop a suspicious mind. Remember we talked about having an open mind and, being, and a critical mind. Well, this is the critical minded bit. You have to be suspicious of what you read. When you read something, your first question is, well, okay, but is it right? You come and look at it your own way. And make your own decisions whether you want to believe in this or not. And then there's the question of what is the method the researcher used? What is the author's contribution? What is the contribution of other people? Uh, and what kind of document is this? Uh, is it an essay, for example? Is it a scientific report or whatever? And then lastly, what are the findings or conclusions? And I put the notion there, skim read, because when you look at papers, for goodness sake, don't read the whole thing. Develop this ability to look at a paper, to look at the title, to look at the abstract, to go and look at the conclusions at the end, right? and that's probably enough. For most papers, you're not going to spend any time reading them. All right? Students, every so often we get students that read the whole thing. They don't read a lot of papers, but they read one or two in great detail. That's really a waste of effort. You just have to learn to sort of get the goods from them very quickly and easily. Skim reading. Okay, an example. You'll find that on the internet somewhere if you look. And there's their report. The new social operating system. The report was called Networked, and it's by those two guys. And that's what it says. That's its abstract. Daily life is connected life. It's rhythms driven by email, text messages, tweets, and Facebook updates. Now, are you thinking critically about that? Daily life is connected life. Its rhythm is driven by email, text messages, tweets, and Facebook updates. Well, you don't have Facebook in China, but you have a, a Facebook in China. Uh, now, that may be true for some people, right? But it's not true for the gardener that I passed when I was walking here. There was a little team of gardeners down there. They're nice, the gardeners. I like the gardeners. And I try to talk to the gardeners. And, they don't talk much English, and I don't talk any Chinese, so it's an interesting conversation. <laughs> we point at things and sort of nod and agree they're nice. Uh, but the, uh, thinking of those gardeners, is their daily life connected to the rhythms of email, text messages, tweets, and Facebook? Not at all. Not at all. They have their own social group and their own way of doing things. There are a few people who might be in that category, aren't there? There are some people in some sorts of areas. These guys who are writing this article, they put it on the internet. Who are they writing it for? They're writing it for the sort of people that they've described there, aren't they? It's actually for those people. If you read it through very carefully, you'll discover in that article that that is actually a research company. It's written a paper 
The paper looks as if it's all about a new idea, bright ideas, good thoughts, progress. But in actual fact, the reason they did it is marketing. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a, a sort of subtle marketing paper. It's really trying to push a point of view. Right? It's, not a, it's not a quality piece of research. It's the sort of thing some students end up quoting in their, in their research papers, and I say, hmm, this hasn't been refereed. This hasn't been, right? They just wrote it, they put it on the internet. Here's another one. This comes from an output called CRI, and there they are, China Research and Intelligence. And this one is Research Report on China's New Energy Industry. All right. I think they're in Shanghai, these people, from memory. Uh, now, that's interesting. That's one of about oh, maybe 15 or 20 papers, a bit like that, that you can get on the internet. If you want the whole paper, you, you can see some of it, but you have to buy it. So who would buy that? If you're involved in the energy industry, and there's lots of companies, people involved in the energy industry, you may want to buy that paper. Right? And if they've got good, a good reputation and they've done a good job, then you will buy it. I, th I thought the price was reasonable. I didn't think it was too high. You know, I thought the price was about right. They'll sell a few. And you can see their website is there, okay, and, and, and their email for orders. Now, who are they? Well, they do market research, and there are some of the reports. So you see the one in the middle, research report on global and China aerosol industry. So they have done a research on the aerosol industry. They have brought together a whole lot of information. How would they do that? Well, basically, you'd call that sort of research desk research, desk research. They do it at their desk. They don't go out talking to people about aerosols. They, they survey, and the same as you were learning to do with your papers, they survey all the literature sources they can find and they bring it into some sort of sensible overview, some sort of summary, as it were. And that's good and important work. That's, that really captures new information. So they've done that one for aerosols. Then they've done this men's grooming thing, right? I presume that's the United Arab Emirates men's grooming market, right? Okay. So, so they've done that one. And then there's another one on India construction chemicals market forecast. That's a nice little company. I was quite impressed by them. I think they've got, a, they've got teams of people working on topics, producing research, selling it. Very practical. And, and there are people like you who've gone on a bit and developed some research skills. So what did we find out about them? They only started quite recently, 2006. Okay, focuses on market research, company research, investment consultation, and other fields. Provides custom research. In other words, if somebody wants some research, they will uh, establish a contract with them and do it. Uh, okay, and they've done more than 40 of those projects. And the bit that I can't see there is somewhere it tells you how many of them there are. Wait a moment. Their clients are private companies to governments, which is good. And that came from LinkedIn. Uh, and the reason that I put that one there, which says pretty much what we just said, was that you can see down the bottom a couple of things. First of all, the company, they say it's privately held. In other words, it's not on the stock exchange. It's, it's private investment that somebody started. It's, it's it'll be worth a little bit, but not too much. Company size, 11 to 50 employees. So they've probably got a core group of 11 or 12, and then they will have other people that will work on particular projects with them. Right? And a lot of these research companies actually do that. I actually was involved in starting a research company like that. It was called ERANS, the Ecological Research Associates of New Zealand, ERANS. And we did research just like these guys, but I think these guys might have made more money than we did. So uh, <laughs> I think their business model is better than our business model. Um, we, we did too many contracts for people that didn't have money, namely broke government departments. Right? And 
We were interested in saving the fish and the whales and goodness only knows what else. We did biological research as well as the business research. So, uh, so that's a good example. So I point that out to you because if you could get involved in a small company like that, that's a really good career move for you. That's something that you could really do. It's quite practical. Last thing from this company. Before we start our research, they say, we do this. Now, look at that list. These are the things that they do and the things that they try to agree with their clients for their reports. Purpose of the report. Do you remember me pushing you to do the purpose of your study? Saying to you, what's your proposition? What are you going to... That's that there. The scope and the definition. Remember me saying to you, you've got to narrow this thing down so it can be done. All right, scope and definition. Report limitations we talked about the other day. You're not doing everything, but report limitations, very common. And then the other things there, list of the sources, well, you know a bit about that, and samples in some of them. So I just put that there for you because that makes the link between what you're doing and what companies like this do. Same stuff. And there's an overview of marketing research, the different kinds of research. We mentioned the desk research on the right. Secondary, they call it desk research, which is really common. But there's also market research methods where you go out and do surveys and things. That, that's very common too. Uh, there's a range of things. We need to go through them. And that's one particular company, the way that it's sort of structured. And if you were to work there, you would start as an associate, which just means a research officer, <laughs> a researcher. OK. We're talking about the classification of research. And we're talking about the purpose of the research. Remember, we had that list of different ways that you could classify research. Now we've got to talk about the purpose. It's a common sort of a way of doing it. We look at what is produced and called research and we ask why it is produced. And we can do this by considering the documents that are produced. And the research is to answer the manager's practical questions. As we've already mentioned, this is research as technology as a tool. But there is also research to find out about management itself. Assuming you've already agreed with me when we began this talk that these are the things that we commonly call management, now we've got research to find out about management, uh, and this research is scientific or science. Okay, so research is science. The problem with that is, I can say to you it's science, but you're all going to have a different view of what science is. And your views of what science is and what other people, those who study these things, their views of what science is, they're very wide apart. They're very different. In other words, the common view of what science is is not the real view of what science is. There is a big debate about what is science. And there are there are two disciplines that I mentioned there. One's epistemology and one's ontology. They're a part of this debate. And the general word for the name for the debate, you might call it all the philosophy of science. OK, now just some working definitions. This word epistemology, epistemology, comes from a Greek word, epistemi, epistemi, a Greek word. It's anything to do with knowledge. All right, so if you, when you see the word epistemology, just think knowledge, okay? That's your, your first thing, think knowledge. So what are the questions that we can ask about knowledge? First of all, there's the question, what counts as knowledge? What counts as knowledge? And usually, what counts as knowledge, it gets contrasted with what is belief. What is belief? So to say you know something, is supposedly stronger than saying that you believe something. All right? So you might all believe something different, but your knowledge could be the same. Well, that's one way. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't go too hard on that if I was you, but, but that's the sort of way that these words get used. All right? So we've got this question of what counts as knowledge. Now, the question of what counts as knowledge 
right, as a branch of epistemology. That leads us, once we say what, what we think knowledge is, then we then have to go on and say how you acquire it, how you get knowledge, how you gain knowledge. And one possible answer to that is that this is what science is about, gaining of knowledge. Uh, that's one answer. And then there's this whole question of when you've got knowledge, how good is it? And you all know that we had Newton's theory of gravitation and everybody thought that was pretty good until Einstein came along and Newton's theory of gravitation was just wiped out totally. We don't use that or need that anymore. We now have another theory of gravitation, totally different. So Newton's gravitation is gone. It's gone in the sense of the theory and the importance of the theory. Doesn't mean we don't use it practically for a whole lot of stuff. When people get blasted off to the moon in the Chinese space program that's going very actively at the moment, the mathematics that they'll do there will be New Newton's physics, Newton's mathematics. But, but nevertheless, we know that it's wrong. We know that it doesn't work in certain circumstances, but it works well enough to send people to the moon. Okay. So epistemology, anything to do with knowledge, what's ontology? You thought epistemology was awkward enough, you want to try ontology. Ontology is about what there is, what exists, i.e. what you've got to explain. All right, what you've got to explain. I'll give you an example. In the physical sciences, there's really only two things that they've got. Matter, matter, and energy, as in waves, matter and energy. Physics says there's matter and energy, and we're going to explain that, okay? So if somebody comes along and says, I saw a ghost over there, this white thing just sort of, I thought I saw a ghost. Well, science can't really address that unless there is matter or energy. <laughs> uh, you, you could believe in ghosts or gods or whatever you want to believe in, but science can't look at that because science has restricted itself to, to matter and energy as waves. Right? Science can investigate heat, because when I walked over here it was very warm and I could even feel it on my umbrella. Yep, science can investigate that. All right? But if I have some sort of strange idea that there is a god giving us heat, science can't investigate that, all right? because it's not matter or energy. So ontology is about what there is to investigate. And ontology becomes really important in relation to the social sciences. Let me show you an example, which I sometimes use. Let's say in physics we're going to do a little demonstration. We're going to, going to drop this thing. And it will go down there at a certain rate, won't it? It will, it will accelerate that way. We know that. And we can calculate when it's going to hit the floor, right? So if we know it starts here, we know the distance, we can accelerate, okay? Let it go. Now, it didn't hit the floor, did it? So if we're doing physics, how does physics explain that it didn't hit the floor? You see the problem? I sucked you in. Right? I said to you, right, we're talking physics here. This thing, when I drop it, it's going to go down and we can calculate when it hits the floor. And that's true, we can. And, and that, that's fine. And we could do lots of these things and we could measure it and it would all be good. But in this particular case, when it went down, I grabbed it. Now, if science is about trying to produce, predict the future, if science is about trying to predict the future, what account can you give, what account can you give to explain my grabbing it? What explanation can you give? The problem is that you can't give an explanation from physics because my grabbing it didn't come from physics, it came from me. So you've got this big difference between the explanation in physics and the explanations that come that are about people. Right? 
about people. And that's the difference between explanations in the physical sciences and explanations in the social sciences. And guess what? In your business research, you are in the social sciences. You're trying to explain things that are to do with people. And that's a heap harder than trying to explain things in physics. Much more of a challenge. So you think, you, hey, people sometimes think business research, part of social science, must be easy. In actual fact, it's probably about as difficult as research gets to do it well. Okay, so let me just summarize. We've looked at the various ways that you can, you, you can classify research. We talked about four different approaches to classifying research. We focused on the fact that research comes from science by way of business research being derived from social science research, and that is derived from physics, from physical research. And next time we can talk more about how that actually happens. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.